start. All right, let's get started. Chapter five. Okay, hopefully we're gonna finish the first part of chapter five. Uh, in this chapter, we're going to study water. This particular uh, important liquid, which is essential for life. That's why the title of this chapter is Water for Life. And then the second half of the chapter, we're going to study what's happening in water. Okay, and water is not only the, the most important liquid on our planet, the substance on our planet, but also a very good solvent. Okay, as you know, we our, for example, our human body is almost to 75, 70 to 75 percent of water, right? It's, it's a good solvent. It's basically how the the living system is based on. So we're not only going to study why water, why nature, whatever above chose water, right, on this planet, and also what's happening in water when water serves as a solvent, okay, for many other substances. Remember what, like I said, water is a very good solvent, can, can dissolve many substances. So, uh, Take a look. These are the questions, like usual, what we have in this, this whole chapter. The okay, first is what are the unique properties of water, which basically makes life possible. Okay, we, were, we said the chapter is what water for life. So what's the property of water makes life possible? And uh, where is the water located that we and other life forms use? And how does water interact with other chemicals? Like I mentioned, what, what makes water a, a good solvent? And how does water interact with other chemicals? And uh, what do the property of water change through its interaction with other components? And finally, there are some thinking and discussions. How do we improve the quality of water? There is a water issue in our planet, on our planet. The water usage and distribution is not equal. We never have a problem of water in the United States, but doesn't mean uh, everywhere in this planet, on this planet, every person on this planet has equal access to what? To clean and drinking water. So there's some water issues to think about as well in this chapter. So let's take a look. Uh, first, some background of water. Okay, the water we drink. Okay, first, water covers 70% of the earth surface we know what our, our, our earth is mostly 70 percent is what ocean only 30 percent is our is land and also around 70 percent i think say 60 percent if you change around 70 percent of the human body is water okay 50 55 percent of our blood is water and 77 percent of our brain is 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 water as well okay and also water is essential to life loss of two percent of your body water leads to thirst 5% loss gives you like a stronger interactions and 10% to 15% or more than 15% may cause, cause the death of the, of the human body, right? And uh, here this picture shows the issue of water, of accessing drinking and in clean water. Uh, even though we mentioned water covers the planet Earth, but we said the water that covers the planet Earth is what? Ocean, basically what? Seawater. So as you can see from this chart, even though the Earth is covered by water, but 97% of the water is sailing, means what? Seawater. Okay, we cannot drink seawater. We cannot live on seawater sea water because they have a lot of salts dissolved in seawater. Only 3% of the planet Earth water is fresh water. That's what? Drinkable. But for that 3% of fresh water drinkable, 30% is really available for us to use because 70% of that 3% of fresh water is stored where? In big ice caps and glaciers. And of course, for those 30% groundwater, they may not be all 
accessible for us because they're either deep underground or, or shallow underground, but they're not all accessible. So basically the easiest accessible drinking water, fresh water for us to use daily is a very, very tiny percentage. Again, remember this chart is from what? From that 3% already. And those tiny percent, less than 1% are the what? Are the surface water. You can see how the percentage decreases. 100%, only 3% is fresh. Out of those 3%, 70% is not to think about it because it's glacier. 30%, groundwater. Sometimes we can have access to groundwater, but not all of them. Some deep groundwater we cannot. The only easy accessible green fresh water we can use is what? That tiny percent of surface water, including lakes and swamps and rivers. So there's a very very like a comparison showing down there is if all the water on our planet fit into a few two liter bottle like this is a two liter bottle the one okay the one that can be really usable easily accessible that for us to drink and use every day easily accessible only four drops you can see how small percentage is even though we are living on the planet of what? Of water. Okay, of water. And uh, this chart shows you the using of water in the United States. Okay, how many gallons of water, 322 billion of water are withdrawn daily? 86% uh, is fresh water, 14% is salt water. And uh, these two activities represent the largest use of water, power plant, and irrigation. Okay, irrigation, we can understand, is what? To growing our, our food. But let me ask you guys, when we study chapter four, why thermoelectric power plant? Basically means what? The, the power plant burning fossil fuels. Why burning fossil fuels use so much water? You guys? Anything? To cool it. Say again? It's a cooling. The cooling system. Remember the power plant, the burner, the this high pressure steam is actually in a sealed system. Those water don't actually lose. The one that is used is what? Is the big cooling system, big body water for cooling. So that is why thermal electric power plant uses a lot of water for cooling purposes. Okay, of course, agriculture is another big use because it, we need water to grow our plants. This is the showing different uh, uses of water, including public supplies, irrigation, thermal power plant. You can see that thermal power plant is basically the, the largest use of water in every year. Okay, yeah, this is by five years, in every five years. Okay, uh, this chart, I don't know what year this was made, but this chart kind of give us an idea of what I mentioned earlier. Uh, we never had a problem of in the United States, we never have a problem of, of accessing safe and drinking water. You can see that over 90% of North America is what is, is, is easily access to, to have an easy access to safe drinking water. But you can see that in some Asian countries and also many African countries, their percentage of, have access, of having access to safe drinking water is what? Is very low. Some some countries even have fifty percent, around fifty percent, or less than fifty percent. Like these have less than forty percent, right? And you can. It's funny is you can see these countries are all on what on the coast, right? It tells us what we cannot live on saline water, even though they're on the coast. They have easy access to seawater. But again, we're talking about safe drinking water. That's that life is based on it for daily uses. Okay, and also you cannot use you cannot use saline water to 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 water your plants, right? You try that next time you put some saline, you water your plants, the plants gonna die because again, they're called hypertonic. Okay, their 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 concentration of salt in there is too high. The cell is gonna lose water if you treat cells, plant cells, uh, living cells, human cells, animal cells with saline water. They're gonna the, the cells gonna be dehydrated. Okay, that's why we cannot use them. And besides that, okay, besides adding on top of that, 
uh, water pollution is another issue to consider, okay, in, including these activities that can cause uh, water pollutions, okay, all the pollutions. Uh, we don't have a lot of water pollution seen here in the United States, again, because they're, they're, they're all, most of our city water, sewer water are treated. But these are something to consider about water pollution, including uh, abandoned mines and also fertilizers and also some household chemicals that were poured down directly to the drain and then what to the ground, okay, so the water. So this will act on, on top of, of, of getting water issues worse due to water pollutions, okay? Now, one topic, okay, before you would study why water is important is we keep saying seawater cannot be directly what used for drinking, but we are covered by seawater. 97% of the water on this planet are seawater. So if there is a way that can convert seawater to what? To safe drinking water, then we can permanently what? Solve the problem of water issue. We don't even work. We never should have water because we're actually surrounded by water. But the process of converting seawater to water takes a lot of energy. Okay, these are two processes I want to show you and show you why they take a lot of energy. The first process is called a distillation. Okay, distillation basically you what you heat seawater. This is a, of course a lab scale distillation device. You heat water, water becomes water vapor, and water vapor being condensed back to what? To liquid water. And the, the liquid water you collect from the condenser will be clean, salt free, because salt dissolved in saline does not evaporate. So this process is called distillation. And of course, the water collected is called distilled water. Okay, you can actually buy distilled water in, in grocery stores. And of course, you can notice this device, even though it is a very small lab scale, distillation needs what? Energy, heat to what? To boil water. Okay, to boil water. Of course, there's some lower small scales they actually use solar panel to collect the heat and or, or, or solar panel generate electricity to, to heat the water. But again, small scales. Okay, you cannot achieve in what in, in daily use scales. Maybe you in a in, in your house you can achieve a small small scale. You can supply your drinking water daily using this process. But again, it takes a lot of energy. This is but this is one way of making fresh water from seawater. Okay, another method, which is even smaller scale, I think, okay, is the only by those personal devices. It's called reverse osmosis. Okay, reverse osmosis. In order to understand what reverse osmosis is, first we need to understand what is osmosis. Okay, osmosis is when you separate two solutions with a semi-permeable membrane. Okay, this membrane is very unique, semi-permembrane. This membrane only allows water molecule to pass through both the directions. Like this one is a membrane. Only water molecule can pass through freely from both directions, from here to here, there to here. If you separate two solutions with different concentrations, for example, if you separate fresh water with seawater with a membrane like this, what happens is Water will flow from fresh water to seawater. That's spontaneous process. Again, net flow. Again, water is flowing in both directions. But the net effect is you will find out water will get more and more into what? Into seawater, which is what? Which is not what we want. We want is what? Make fresh water from where? From seawater. So that's natural or spontaneous osmosis process. It's water from less concentrated into more concentrated. Of course, we want the opposite way, right? We want what? We want water from seawater into what? Into fresh water. So what we would do is we need to add pressure of using a pump, using a high pressure pump to the seawater side to push the seawater from the more concentrated to what? To less concentrated. That's why we call this process what? 
reverse osmosis. Does it make sense? Again, reverse osmosis means what? You need extra energy to do that. Without the pressure, without the pump, the water is not going to flow into the fresh water. It's going to flow where? To seawater. Okay, again, it takes a lot of energy. It needs a high pressure pump. That's why it can never be applied to a larger scale. Because see, this is a reverse osmosis pump. Okay, you can actually, if you're, if you like, like a sea, uh, sea fishing, like a, a ocean fishing, you can you can bring a pump like this. You can actually get water from seawater and then use the os reverse osmosis to get some drinking water on your boat. But again, very small scale. You may use that seawater to the water to to clean your food or to drink. But again, very small scale. Okay, very small scale. So. Making seawater or making fresh water from seawater is a big topic. Okay, people have been working on this for years, but again, because it takes a lot of energy, the scale remains very small. The cost remains high. So our chapter five discussion, okay, you guys are gonna read uh, and watch a video um, for this discussion assignment for chapter five is the process of making fresh water from seawater. And that process is called desalination. Means what? Remove saline, remove salt from seawater to make what? To make fresh water. And the video you're watching, of course, is a larger scale. Actually in a factory, you can see that this is the factory. They, they build the factory along the coast so that they can easily, what? Get seawater. But again, read how the process works and also comment on what are the limitations. What are the disadvantage of using? Why this is not using everywhere? If if this process is can be applied to everywhere, then again we don't want we don't have an water issue. Why not? This process can be applied to everywhere. Why there's very big limitations? Again, this is our chapter five discussion, right? On Blackboard. Okay. Next. Okay. Next. Other water treatment device I want to mention here to you guys. Last one I think is. This device, uh, I don't know if you have used that a lot, uh, used that before. It's called Life Straw, called a water filter. Okay, this is nothing related to the one, two techniques we have just discussed, distillation or, or reverse osmosis. This is a filtration device. A filtration device is basically convert water contains mud, dust, sand, or even sometimes bacteria. You filter those large particles off from water to what? To drink in an emergency case. Okay, if you're in a home, no one will use that, right? You have our safe, clean tap water. Why would we use that? But if you're hiking, if you're in a in in, in, in the in the wild, you don't have safe drinking water. Your bottle of water run out. You have a, you have a swamp. You have a, you have a you have a pond, and you bring this. You can actually what? Drink some of water by using this filtration device. And of course, this Life Straw, this company actually, they're investing this device and use that device and give those devices to those countries that don't have safe drinking water. Okay, for example, these countries, they don't have safe drinking water because their water treatment techniques or sometimes the cost. So they may have some water, it's fresh water, but not drinkable. So they will donate these pieces and you can actually buy those. There's like 10 bucks per I think last time I checked uh, maybe a little more 15 a piece they have a lifetime of course after filtration of how many gallons of water you have to replace the filter or replace the device but it's a life strong personal water filter okay that's different that's not converting seawater to fresh water is actually by filtering what toxic or dirty substances from uh, some other water device and this is a picture showing you and that's a link you can read, I think CNN or whatever news, is um, they discovered Mars. Okay, this planet has water lake. Okay, this is the picture of the, uh, this is not a real picture. I think they do like a 3D treatment of, this is the lake, a water lake on Mars looks like. Okay, again, people will be talking about, Elon Musk is talking about what we, we one day we may, we may colonize what, Mars. If our planet is no longer livable, our next stop, the, the, the best chance for us is most likely Mars. And this is the first sign we found water, liquid water, 
in Mars. You can read the news, and of course, you can read more articles about this uh, in, in NASA website, probably. All right, so that's all for the background and introduction of water and, and some background of water issues. Let's take a look of, 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 about the chemistry and take a look about why water is important. Why nature chose water to be what? To be the basis of, of life. Okay. The reason is water, this simple substance, has a few peculiar properties. Okay, this word peculiar means what, guys? What does the peculiar word mean? Weird. Strange, yeah. right? Strange means what? Something unexpected. Okay, something that actually doesn't fall into the, our prediction. Okay, that's what we call peculiar. And what are they? Listed here. Okay, the first property is water is a liquid. Okay, like we, we, Everybody knows water is a liquid. You even don't think about why water is a liquid. If you compare water with these molecules, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, for example, you will see that water molecular mass, molar mass, is 18, is actually much what? Smaller than these. Nitrogen is 28, oxygen is 32, carbon dioxide is 44. Oxygen is actually a very small weight, lightweight molecule. But these are all gases. Water, on the other hand, is a liquid, which is very peculiar. Another peculiar property which is related to the liquid water is the reason water is a liquid because water has a high boiling point. Not only water is a liquid, water does not boil what? Easily. When water doesn't boil easily means what? Water does not change from liquid to gas what? Water doesn't evaporate much. That tells us we can have a certain amount of water on what? On the surface, not as gas. Think about it. If water boils easily, what do we have? Water vapor everywhere. We don't have liquid water around us. We don't have oceans. We don't have lake, lakes. So another property which is related to the property of water being liquid is the boiling point of water is very high compared with other liquids. Okay, the boiling point of water, again, is a number you should always memorize, 100 degrees Celsius. Okay, you guys are not familiar with Celsius, but this is a magic number. Okay, magic. The freezing point of water is what? Zero degrees Celsius. Boiling point of water is what? 100 degrees Celsius. You guys wonder, ever wondered how they make a thermometer? Remember, the thermometer is in Celsius, not in Fahrenheit. Okay, most thermometers, scientific, your thermometer, for example, in your lab kit. Do you know how they make a thermometer? They put oil, they put water in, they put the thermometer in freezing water. We, again, freezing water is what? Zero. And then they put the thermometer in where? In boiling water. What is boiling water? A hundred. So they mark these two lines, zero and a hundred. Then they what? They equally divide that zero and a hundred line into what? Into hundred pieces. Each piece is what? Is one degree. That's how actually basically a thermometer is marked, is calibrated. At sea level, boiling water temperature should be 100 degrees Celsius. All right? So that's another property again. Uh, the third property, which is even amazing, amazing. This one, this property you don't see in any other substances, is when water freezes, Freezes means what? Change from liquid to solid. Okay, when water freezes, change from liquid to solid, the volume of water expands. In another word, when water freezes, the ice volume is going to be bigger than the original water. That makes Okay, that makes the density of water bigger than the density of ice. Okay, density is mass over volume. When volume expands, means what? Density is decreasing. So ice density is smaller than water, which is very unique. Most substances, when they become solid, the density would be bigger. Only water, when freezes, the density is going to what? 
decrease. Why does it decrease? Because the volume of water expands. Okay, so keep in mind these three properties we're gonna to explain to them, and then we're gonna see how, why they make life possible and why they are important. Okay, why they're important. Okay, before we explain those, okay, before we can study those, we have to take a look at the structure of water. Okay, in order to explain those peculiar properties, we have to take a look at the structure of water. This picture shows you the structure, all the structure you have got, you guys have seen what? In previous chapters. The first is what? Showing how oxygen and hydrogen are sharing electrons. Second picture, we replace the bonding pairs into what? I'm sorry, replace the sharing bond uh, electrons into what? Into, into a single bond. We call that what? Covalent bond, right? And then in chapter three, we studied because on the central atom oxygen, it has four electron groups. And those four electron groups will adopt a geometry called no the four groups will adopt a geometry called what what's that called four groups you guys even did the lab of making model it's called what tetrahedral right okay tetrahedral but in the tetrahedral geometry of these four groups two of them are what long pairs you only have two atoms, basically. So if you only look at two atoms, the geometry of water is what? It's bent. It's bent. And the bond angle is around 109.5, but because of these two lone pairs, it's actually smaller than 109.5. That is why it's around 105 degrees. But again, all you need is to know is the 105 number for this class. Okay, that's why water molecule looks like this. Two hydrogens bonded to oxygen in a bended geometry. Okay, so again, these are the structures or different representations of water. Now, once we know the structure, let's take a look. The bond, okay, the bond. When atoms form a covalent bond, what is a covalent bond again? What is a covalent bond? The atoms are what? Sharing electrons, right? But when they share electrons, they actually have different ability to attract the shared electrons. In another word, when atoms share electrons, there's a chance the atoms may not share the electrons equally. Some electrons, some atoms may have greater attraction to the shared electron. Some atoms may have a what? Weaker attraction to the shared electrons. So we call the attraction of the shared electrons in a covalent bond by a certain atom, we call that electron activity. So in another word, in a covalent bond, Atoms may have different what? Electron activity. What is electron activity? Again, the attraction of what? Electrons. Some may share more, some one share less. The one that shares more are what? The one with greater electron activity. The one that shares less are the one with what? Smaller electron activity. Does it make sense, guys? Yes. Now, this chart listed some of the main group or representative group elements, the A group elements, and you can take a look at their electron activity number below their element side. And you can find a very nice trend about it. The trend is when you move across a period, the electron activity is actually what? Increasing, do you guys see that? When you move down a column, the electron activity is actually what? Decrease. That means what? This quarter, don't worry about noble gas. Noble gas doesn't attract the electrons because they're what? They're satisfied. 
this corner of the periodic table will be what? The elements with what? With great electron length, with the highest electron length. Of course, the very corner, the flooring, is the element with the highest what? Electron length. Highest means what? When fluorine share with electrons with other elements, fluorine is only going to what? Attract more than anybody. Why? Because fluorine has the highest electron activity. Does it make sense, guys? Yes. And because of this trend, we know the electron activity is greater around here. Means what? Nonmetals, these are all nonmetals, usually have what? Much greater electron activity than what? Than metals. You guys see that? Because this part is always what? Not metals. Metals is already where? There. And we know the trend is what? Increasing from left to right, from bottom to top. So the non metal corner of the periodic table have what? Has greater electron activity than the non metals. Now, once you understand that, let's take a look at the bond in water. Water bond is what? H and OH, right? OH bond is, is what's in water. Oxygen and hydrogen, their electron activity is different. Oxygen electron activity is 3.5. Hydrogen electron activity is 2.1. It tells me what? Oxygen attracts electrons where? More than hydrogen. Even though they're sharing, but oxygen attracts what? More. When oxygen attracts more, because electrons are negatively charged. So this higher attraction of electrons makes oxygen bears a slightly more negative charge. Do you see this sign? Delta means partial. Partial means what? They're still sharing, but oxygen shares what? A little bit more. So because of the fact Oxygen will carry a slight or partial negative charge. And of course, hydrogen will carry a what? Partial positive charge. Again, this sign is called delta. Delta means partial. Again, why they're partial? Because they're still a what? Sharing. Okay, all these things because oxygen has greater electron activity. Oxygen is going to share what? A little bit more than the hydrogen. And because of that, because of the fact these two have differing electron activity, oxygen shares a little bit more electrons, we call the bond, okay, we call this bond a polar covalent bond. Okay, this word polar means what? They're not sharing electrons equally. Somebody shares more than the other. So OH bond is a polar covalent bond. In this polar covalent bond, the electrons are not equally shared, but what? But attracted more towards where? Towards oxygen. Oxygen is the element with what? With greater electron activity. And in order to represent a polar bond, we have two ways. One way is like this. You mark the charge. Partial negative on the what? On the more electron negative atom. Partial positive on the what? Less electron negative atom. Or we draw an arrow. The head of the arrow points to the more electron negative atom. And also the tail of the arrow, you put a cross. We call this arrow a dipole. If you use a dipole arrow, you can tell people, hey, this bond is what? Is polar. Which one shares more negative? The one at the hero arrowhead. And this is the picture of that bond. You can see that oxygen is much bigger. I mean bigger than what? In the cloud of electrons. The, the electron shared cloud is more attracted to where? To the oxygen. Does this make sense? There are two ways of representing a polar bond. One way, again, is just mark the charge or use a what? A dipole arrow. Okay. Arrow head, again, points where? The more electron negative element. Okay. 
before I lunch on it. So let's take a look or new look at chemical bonds. Okay, now you know the bonds. Let's take a new look at a chemical bond. When electrons, sorry, when atoms A and B make a chemical bond, when their electron activity values are similar or the same, then the electron activity difference means the electron activity of A minus the electron activity of B. This value is going to be what? When, they're, when the electron activity value are similar or the same, then the difference between those two electron activity will be what? Will be what? Will be a what kind of number? Again, when A and B sharing electrons, when their electron activity value are similar or even the same, then the difference between those two electron activity, we call that electron activity difference, will be a what? Will be a what? Small number, right? If they're the same or similar. Think about two numbers if they're the same, then A minus B will be what? Will be zero. If they're similar means what? The difference will be what? Will be small. So when the difference is small, most times we define is if the difference is between zero to 0.4, Again, this is difference. Okay, difference means what? A minus B. Then the sharing of electrons will be considered equally. Why they're equally sharing? Because their electron negativity is what? It's similar, right? Or the same. If they're sharing equally, like this, you can see the electrons are, are clouds are equally shared on both sides. We call the bond a non-polar covalent bond, or sometimes called a pure covalent bond. Does this make sense? Non-polar, which, which is different than what the word we just said, polar. Now, if the electron activity's difference is bigger, more different means what? One is bigger than the other, right? Between 0 0.4 to 2.0, like this range, then A and B will share electrons unequally the one with greater electron activity will share what share more the one with less electron activity will share less with the positive charge we call this bond again what polar covid bond does it make sense now what if the electron activity difference is so big what if, what do you mean so big for example if the electron activity is, if, if you consider it sharing between fluorine and lithium, take a look, they're far away from each other, right? So the difference is what? It's huge. If that's the case, if the difference is bigger than 2.0, 2.3, if that's the case, they don't even want to share. What happens is the one with greater electron activity, for example, fluorine, will just take the electrons from the other guy. If somebody take the electrons on itself, it will have what charge? Negative charge. And take a look at this negative, what is different from that negative? Because they're no longer what? Sharing. No longer sharing means what? I just grab it, give me my electrons. I want that, and then I want the pure charge of that electron. And you lose that electron, you will get a what? pure positive charge. If that's the case, we don't even call this bond a covalent bond because they are no longer sharing. We call this bond ionic bond. Does this make sense? So we can see that different types of bond in chemistry is basically determined by what? The difference of what? Of electron activity. Does this make sense? Similar electron negativity, what? Non-polar bond. Greater electron negative difference, polar bond. If the electron activity is too different, huge difference, then you will make a what? Ionic bond. Then the electrons won't be shared. The electron will be what? Transferred. Somebody takes from another guy. That means what? Transferred. Okay, we'll see that in chapter, in chapter five and six. Okay, we'll see this bond. All right, so quickly, 
let's take a look at this quick concept check. Now, I'll work on A and B with you, and then you guys go ahead and figure out a C. Okay, C is not easily figured out. You have to use the numbers. But A and B, you're not even supposed to use the number. You can figure it out. Okay, the question is, there are two pairs. Okay, A, there are two bonds. Okay, B, there are two bonds. Let's think of A. HF bond and HCl bond. They ask you, hey, I have two bonds. Based on what we learn about electron activity, can you tell me which bond is more polar? How do we know bond is more polar? We know when a bond is polar, it means what? What tells us a bond is polar? The electron activity is what? Different, right? The difference is between 0.4 to 2.0, right? It's a little bit more different. So if you want to know which bond is more polar, means what? The difference has to be what? Bigger. Is that right? Bigger difference means what? The bond is what? More polar because the one guy is more greedy than the other. Does it make sense? So the question is, can you tell me these two bonds, which one is more polar? HF. Why HF is more polar? Bigger difference in electronic. Bigger difference because they're both sharing with what? Hydrogen, but fluorine is much more electronegative than chlorine means what? The difference between these two will be what? Bigger. Bigger difference means what? Polar bond. Very good. How about B? With the same logic, which one is more polar? Uh, OH is more polar. OH is more polar because? Oxygen is more electronegative, makes what? OH bond difference is what? Is bigger. Okay, very good. And C, again, you guys figure it out. You may have to use the number to do a math and see which one is more polar. Okay, I'll leave it here. Okay, but A and B, like I said, you without the table, you can solve the question. Of course, you need a periodic table, but not that table with the number. All right? So, we have studied... They share equally, we call the bond nonpolar. If they're sharing not equally, we, we call the bond what? Polar. Good. But there's a kind of a bond between A and B. What about a monocate? Why we call why we say this? What, 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 why we say this? What about monica? Think about water, for example. Water has how many OH bond? Water has how many OH bond? Two. Two OH bond, right? We previously we only talk about the bond itself, right? But water actually has two OH bonds. So that means you cannot just consider the bond. You have to consider more in order to tell the story of the whole monarchy. So what about a monarchy? How do we know if a molecule is polar or not? That depends on two types. In this class, we don't discuss too much. We only discuss two types. One type is if a molecule only contains nonpolar bond. What is a nonpolar bond? The electron activity is what? Very similar or the same, right? What makes the electron activity the same? Same atoms, then the what? The electron activity is the same. So a molecule like this with the same number, the same type of atoms. Then they have the same what? Electron activity. If they have the same electron activity, that means what? The bond is nonpolar. So when the molecule like this only contains nonpolar bonds, then the molecule itself is also called nonpolar. Good? That's one thing. Again, now we're talking about the whole molecule. But these molecules are still too simple because they only have one nonpolar bond. When the molecule contains polar bond, then the molecule may or may not be polar. Not is going to be considered together with the geometry of the molecule. So not only you need to consider the bond, we know it contains polar bond, but you have to consider the what? The geometry. Let's take a look. Let's take a look at these two examples. The top example is what? Water, right? When the water contains what? 
the bond is what? Polar. So that means this OH bond is polar. That OH bond is what? Polar. Good, we have two polar bonds. But if you look at the geometry of the molecule, again, water geometry is what? Bent. Is that right? Bent is considered a non-symmetrical geometry. Asymmetrical means what? It's not symmetrical. Why do I say not symmetrical? You can imagine like that. We know when the bond is polar, we will have an arrow points where? Points oxygen. Is that right? This bond is also polar. We have an arrow points what? Points oxygen. Think about it. If you have two arrows points like this, the overall of the arrow is going to point where? So one point there, one point there. The overall is going to point where? Up. Right? If you learn physics, you can think of if you have one force point that way, another force point that way, then the overall force is going to point where? Straight up. If we draw like this. Is that right? That means what? These two arrows are not canceling each other. They're actually going to what? To one direction. And because of this fact, bent is asymmetrical. If that is the case, water molecule is considered polar. Now let's clear what we have learned. OH bond is what? Polar. OH bond is what? Polar. But the water geometry is what? Bent. Asymmetrical geometry. So the overall molecule of water is also what? Polar. What does it tell us? Polar tells us what? This end of water with the oxygen will have what charge? Negative charge. This end where the hydrogen are located will have what? Positive charge. Is that right? If you consider the whole molecule, you will find out the molecule of water has two ends. One end has what? Negative charge. Another end has what? Positive charge. That is why water is polar, because you have charge on it. Does it make sense now? Now take a look at the bottom case. We have this beryllium chloride. The bond between Be and chlorine. Chlorine is what? More negative. More electron negative. So this bond is what? Polar. This bond is what? Polar. But if you look at the geometry of this molecule, on the beryllium, how many groups of electrons are we having? Two groups. If there are two groups, what's the geometry? Linear. Linear means what? These two arrows, one to the left, one to the right, means what? They cancel each other. Is that right? Think about it. Like, again, physics, if you have two forces, one pointing to the left, one pointing to the right, the same force, the object is going to stay what? Still. So these two dipoles cancel each other. Why cancel? Because the geometry of this guy is what? Linear. If they cancel each other, this molecule as a whole is what? Non-polar. You guys see that? Polar bond, polar bond, the molecule is what? Non-polar. Polar bond, polar bond, the molecule is what? Polar. Why is that? Because they have different geometry. Does it make sense? So that's why we say earlier. A molecule with polar bond can may or may not be polar. Depends on what? The geometry. Okay, the geometry. So please keep that in mind. I'll leave this exercise to you. Please take a very close look. Like it says, this class we don't talk about a lot of molecules. We want to take a look at the typical ones. They understand the concept. What is the bond polarity? What is the what? The molecule polarity. For a bond, we only consider what? If we're talking about a bond, we only consider what? Electron activity, what? Difference, right? For a molecule, we are considering both the bond and what? And the geometry of the molecule. Does this make sense? Okay, this question asks you, compare the geometry, compare these two molecules, water and carbon dioxide. Why one is polar, one is not polar? Again, using the same logic we discussed here, I hope you guys do use this practice well. 
and try to explain. Okay, try to explain. All right, so that is polarity. Now, okay, now, after we study polarity of water, we can explain the property. Okay. If you remember, we said earlier, water is what? Polar. Is that right? Water is polar means what? The oxygen has a what charge? Negative charge. The hydrogen has a what? Positive charge. So if you imagine you have a lot of waters together, what happened is the oxygen, because it's negatively charged, will what? Interact with the hydrogen of another water, which is what? Positive charge, because they, they have different charges, they like each other, right? The same. The hydrogen of this water will interact with what? With the oxygen of another water. And we have a network of interactions in this dashed fashion. We call this interaction hydrogen bonding. Okay, hydrogen bonding. What is the hydrogen bonding? Hydrogen bonding is when a highly electronegative atom, such as oxygen, nitrogen, fluorine, is bonded to hydrogen. You will expect hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding is a very strong intermolecular bond. What does inter mean, guys? Between, right? International means what? Between different countries. Intermolecular means what? The bond is between water molecules, not within. That's why here you can take a look. We use what? Dash to represent what? Hydrogen bond. Here, these blue lines are what? Covalent bonds. Is that right? You can see that. The hydrogen bonding, even though they're strong, but they're still between molecules. So compared to the covalent bond, they're still weaker, much weaker. Around 1 one fifteenth of a covalent bond. But hydrogen bonding is a very strong intermolecular bond. What makes this bond strong? Two reasons. Okay, two reasons. One reason is, again, oxygen electron activity is what, guys? High or low? Oxygen electron activity. High. High, right? Remember, we see where is the oxygen located? Take a look. Oxygen is located, located, located right next to what? To fluorine. Take a look the value. Is what? Is high. High means what? High means the OH bond is what? Very polar. Is that right? Very polar means what? You have a lot of negative here, a lot of what? Positive here. That's one reason. Another reason is hydrogen. Remember, hydrogen is which element? The first element. First element with only one proton and what? One what? Electron. So the size of the hydrogen is tiny, tiny. When the hydrogen is tiny, means what? These two atoms can get what? Very close. Is that right? Even they're between molecules, but because hydrogen is small, so the distance between these two guys can be very close because of these two reasons. The bond is too polar, very polar. Why bond is polar? Because oxygen is what? Very electronegative. Another reason is hydrogen is small. So because of these two reasons, these dashed lines, even though they're intermolecular interactions, called hydrogen bonding, but they're very strong. Okay, they're very strong. Now, if they're very strong, Think about it. If they're very strong, it means what? What, it mean, what does it mean when the bond is strong? When the bond is strong it means what? It takes more energy. It takes a lot of energy to what? Break it. To break it. What do we need? When do we need to break the bond between water? When do we need to do that? What change do we need to do to break the interactions between water molecules, that means to make water molecules separate. What, what change do you think? Change from what to what when water molecule will become separated, like a 
far away from each other. It's boiling. Boiling, right? From liquid to what? Gas. To gas. So think about it. Because this is strong, takes a lot of energy to what? To separate. When do we need to separate? When boil, we need to, we can separate. So that means what? You have a lot of energy needed to what? To boil water. That explains why water boiling point is what? So freakishly hot. Is that right? Why is that? Because hydrogen bond is so strong. You can take a look. This is the, the trend of, of H2O, H2S, H2S. They're in the same group. Supposedly, they will be similar, the boiling point. You can see that H2S boiling point is minus, minus 50 something. H2SE boiling point is around minus 40. Even H2T boiling point is less than zero. These are all gases. But take a look at water. Water supposedly should be here, but where is water? Why? Because of what? Hydrogen bond. Okay, hydrogen bond is so strong, even though not as strong as covalent bond, but it's very strong. So that takes a lot of energy to break the hydrogen bond. In order for what? In order for water to boil. So that explained the actual boiling point of water is what? It's 100 degrees Celsius. Much higher than we thought. And that's why remember we said earlier, peculiar property of what? Of water. And this is one of them. Explained. Hydrogen bonding constant. Another property. Okay, another property. When water is a liquid, when water is a liquid, because of the hydrogen bonding, okay, because of hydrogen bonding, water molecules are interacting with each other. But when water freezes, okay, when water freezes, water molecules are frozen, no longer moving as, as free as, as liquid water. But Hydrogen bonding is still existing. And because of the hydrogen bonding, this is liquid water, that's ice. Because of the hydrogen bonding, you can see that there are actually what? Holes between waters or gaps between water because of what? Hydrogen bonding. And those hydrogen bonding again are actually frozen. So that's why the structure of the ice is porous. Means what? They're actually empty what? Holes in the structure of ice and okay, and the empty space of ice is much more organized than the empty space of water molecule. You can see that this is the structure of ice. The water molecules are like soldiers now. They're actually aligned very beautifully. And meanwhile, they're not as closely packed as when water is in liquid. You can see this is liquid, this is in ice. What did I tell you? The, the, the gap, the pores in ice is what? Is bigger than what? Than the, than the holes in, in water. Why is that? Because when water freezes, the water molecules are actually more beautifully aligned with each other now. Think about it, it's like a group of people. When they're liquid, a group of people are like stacking with each other like in a random way. But when you freeze these people, those people are actually staying very still in lines, which makes the what? The water molecules not as tight as liquid water molecules packing with each other. And when they're not as tight packed or not as closely packed, will result in what? Ice gets what? Bigger, expands, expands. You guys have ex life experience. When, when during, during extreme winter, you need what? You need to maybe cover your water pipe. Because what? If your water pipe freezes, what happens? Your pipe is gonna burst. Same reason. When water freezes, the volume is going to what? Bigger. Why bigger? Because the water molecules are actually beautiful aligned in a hexagon shape. You can see this is the most green ice. That is very unique. Why unique? Most substances, 
when they freeze, their volume is going to be, be smaller. When water volume becomes smaller, most substances are actually more dense, except water. Now, go back to water. We know that's unique. But what that is tell, implies, water, when water freezes because the density is smaller, why? Because water is bigger. When density is smaller, it means when water freezes, water becomes ice. The ice is going to be floating on the surface of water, right? When you see ice, when you throw a piece of ice to 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 bottle water, what happens? The ice is going to what? Float. So that means what? When there's surface ice, they often cover by what? On the surface. When they're covering on the surface, what do they tell you? Life can still what? Happen underneath the surface of ice. Does that ring a bell? Think about it. If water were like other substances, if they freeze, they become more dense. Then ice is going to form from where? From the bottom. So think about it. When the winter comes, rivers, lakes, they all freeze like a big chunk of ice. There's going to be no what? No life possible. Right? Some of the you know, humans, animals don't live in water all the time. Think about it. If you don't, if all the water freezes, there's no food. Then other animals are gonna what? All die. Okay. Because of this, life became possible in where? In water. No matter summer or winter. Why? Because even during winter, ice covers and where? The surface. Okay. Also because of this property. Okay, brother. And because of hydrogen bond. That's again something you probably never, you never thought of. Okay, this is a quick practice. Again, I'll leave it to you. Ask you to draw some water molecules and show water, uh, water changing from liquid to gas. Okay, this is I, I draw some things similar. You can do something similar. This is I draw three water molecules. These are hydrogen bondings. When when they become gas, water molecules become what? Become separated. Hydrogen bond is breaking. Okay, hydrogen bond is broken. Right. So. A quick summary, okay, quick summary, when we talk about the bonding. Hydrogen bonding, again, is the bonding between what? Water molecules. So when you break the hydrogen bonding, the change is what? Physical. Why? Because when you break the hydrogen bonding, water molecules themselves still what? Remain intact. You're still having water molecules. You're just changing from liquid water molecule to what? To gas water molecule. So breaking hydrogen bonding or boiling is a what? Is a physical change. Okay, that's why boiling point is a physical property. Only when you break what? A covalent bond of water, then you are doing what? chemical change. But because water covalent bond is so strong, OH bond is very polar and strong, it's very hard to break the AOH bond, which makes water molecule actually what? Very stable. Very stable. Okay. Finally, okay. one last topic before we finish today. Another important property of water, we didn't call it peculiar, but another very important property of water is the term called specific heat. What is specific heat? Specific heat is the amount of energy required to increase the temperature of one gram of substance by one degree Celsius. Again, it's kind of sound kind of weird. What does it mean? It means if I want to increase one gram of something by the temperature of one degree, how much heat is needed? Okay, by reading this, I, I think some of you still get confused. Well, what, what are you talking about? Take a look at this chart. Okay, then we can compare. You can have a better understanding of what's best for For gold, for example. 
Okay, we know where everybody now goes. If I want to increase the temperature of gold, one gram of gold by one degree Celsius, I need this much energy, 0 0.126 joule. Okay, I don't know how much is 0 0.16 joule. I'll take a look at water. If I want to increase one gram of water, the same by one degree Celsius, I need how much energy? Four point something joule. Take a look at these two numbers. What does it tell you? In order to increase the temperature of water, I need how much? I need what? A lot more heat than what? Than gold. Is that right? Is that right? And if you think a different way, if I have the same amount of heat, okay, same amount of heat. For example, if I have four joule, if I have this much heat, I can increase the temperature of water by how much? One degree. But think about it, if I have the four joule, I can increase the temperature of gold by how much? 40 degrees. Is that right? Just like you're lighting a match. If you heat water, maybe the temperature of water only can increase by what? One degree. If you heat that match, heat the gold with that same match, your gold may be, become what? Too hot to touch. What does that tell you? The temperature of water does not change too much when the heat is absorbed. Is that right? Think about it. Why? Because water has a what? Huge heat specific. Or we could say water has a huge heat capacity, right? What does capacity mean? I can take a lot of heat without changing temperature what? Much. And if you look at this chart, these are a lot of substances. Water has what? The greatest heat capacity, right? Means what? You cannot change water temperature too much. But the same heat may change the temperature of gold or lead or other metals too, too hot to touch. That also makes what? Water unique, right? Think about it. if you're living around water, if the water temperature changes too much, what it can cause? The weather gonna change what? A lot. But because of water takes a lot of heat, when you live somewhere near water, like we're on the South Carolina, the water change, weather change, will be very small. Compare if you live in the mountain or live in the, in the desert without water. If you live in the desert, the daytime temperature and the nighttime temperature is gonna be what? Gonna be hugely different. Why? Because sand rocks don't have as much heat capacity as what? As what? This is the picture showing you 100 calorie of heat may increase the temperature of water from 25 to 26. But the same amount of heat may increase the rock temperature from 25 to what? To 30. Tells what? Water can actually take a lot of heat in without changing temperature much. And we call that property what? Specific heat. And finally, last word. You guys take a look at this number. Do you, have you recall this number? 4.186. Where do we see this number? That's conversion factor between two units of energy. One is joule, another one is what? Calorie. You guys remember that? That's how calories is defined. One calorie is what? The amount of heat needed to increase one gram of water by what? One degree Celsius. That's what we define calorie. Do you see that? One calorie is what? 4.18. Six joule. That is defined by the specific heat of water. Okay, again, these are all the properties of water, peculiar property of water, or important properties of water, and also some water issues. So we'll stop here. And um, next time, okay, next week, next next week, we're gonna continue on the topic of water acting as a solvent.